Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. Welcome to Freestyle Friday, where I get to do what I want. Do you like sake? I do, somewhat. It's not my go-to in general, but I do enjoy a well-made sake. You may have heard that last week. Today's show will be the second part of three shows on sake. Today's show will delve even deeper into the beverage, so get comfortable again, grab your favorite sake, and let's have some fun. Just like last week, let me address Japanese pronunciation here for a minute. For the most part, the sounds for Japanese are fairly familiar to English speakers. We share a lot of the same sounds. As with any language, there are some that are not familiar and can be difficult. Many words have a Western version of the pronunciation that we understand, but it's technically incorrect in Japan. I will do my best with staying as true to proper Japanese pronunciation as possible, but I may slip into what I'm used to saying or using the more Western way of pronunciation. In addition, I'll put the Japanese word using the most common Western spelling in the lower third when I first use a word to help reinforce each term, and I may do this more than once depending on the word and if I feel like I really need to do that. I'll also include the English meaning. I've included a link to a YouTube video that helps explain how to pronounce Japanese words if you're interested in up your game. I highly suggest watching this. So last week, I covered the basics of sake. Let's recap the summary I did from last episode. Sake has been around since at least 700 AD. It is made from rice with premium sake made up from up to 80 different varieties. The most popular being Yamada Nishiki. It uses what is known as MPF for multiple parallel fermentation, meaning the conversion of starch to sugar and then sugar to alcohol happens at the same time in the same vessel. The heart of the rice grain is where this starch lives and the more you mill the rice, the higher the quality of starch you get. This translates into higher quality sake. As you go up in quality, the sake changes from being earthy, rustic and savory to more fruity and floral. The addition of brewer spirit means the prefix junmai is dropped and it adds minerality to the sake while making it lighter. Now for all of you sake nerds out there, I'm sure you're like, you're leaving out so much story. I know, I wanted to keep these episodes to a reasonable length while also getting some tasting in. So this show, I'll get a little bit more geeky and we'll taste this, we'll taste this sake uh, at the end. For today's show, I'll again utilize the Comprehensive Guide to Sake, the Wikipedia entry on sake, and Guild Psalms Expert Guide to Sake. Links below to everything so you can read more. The Comprehensive Guide is fantastic, and I found it after doing most of my research, so it really just confirmed a lot of what I had already learned. It does fill in some blanks and connect some dots along with giving more info. Guild Psalms Expert Guide is only available via subscription. I highly recommend them as a source if you are in the industry. It's focused on wine, but it is also a good source in other adult beverages. So a few things I left out from last week's history lesson. First, the term sake itself means just alcohol, as in all types of alcohol. This is what was recorded in the third century. So just ordering a sake in a Japanese bar could get you a variety of tasty adult beverages. The proper term for sake is nihonshu. If you break down that word, it's nihon and shu, or Japanese alcohol. Shu is another term for alcohol. Because governments love to make money and want specific terms, the word seishu, or clear alcohol, is the legal term. That way the government can get paid. Speaking of getting paid, if you guess it was time to talk about my line of merchandise for WWTV when I call my outstanding line of merchandise, then you'd be right. Must get out of the way now. My outstanding line is all about positivity and it's based upon my response of outstanding when I'm asked how I'm doing. The outstanding line is all t-shirts for now. I have polos, t-shirts, and accessories for the WWTV line. Check out this sweet logo t-shirt. Both lines are getting more variations in the future, so look for them on Zazzle. 
Link below in the description, so please check them out. All right, now let's get back to what we want to be talking about, which is sake. Also related about getting paid last week, I talked about a switch from barrels to enamel tanks. Well, that wasn't just for cleaner sake. It was also supposedly to protect that tax revenue. First, the wooden barrels do provide a great breeding ground for bacteria, and that can be bad for sake, among other beverages. But something else happens when using barrels. You whiskey drinkers know it as the angel share. Yeah, evaporation. Well, it's a small amount, estimated to be around 3% over time with a large enough production. Pennies turn into dollar dollar bills, y'all. Sorry, I, I never really used that word y'all, but it fit the part. Anyway, this both improved the sake and helped keep that extra revenue coming in. To be clear, the tax revenue thing from, is from Wikipedia's entry and is not really mentioned anywhere else. I suspect that like many things in the 20th century, people found ways to improve quality, better sanitation, better taste, less loss of profits, etc. Now, early in the 20th century, during the Russo-Japanese War from 1904 to 1905, the practice of homebrewing sake was made illegal. Again, this is from the Wikipedia entry. At the time, upwards of 30% of Japan's tax revenue came from sake, so this ban was expected to increase tax revenue. This might be one reason why there are so many licensed breweries in Japan, but not all of them are active uh, producers of sake. Like I said, this is mostly from the Wikipedia entry. The reason I mention this part is that that entry has a citation, a citation note concerning taxes, like in, there needs to be a citation, all right? Now, Japan went from about 30,000 breweries in the late 19th century and early 20th century to approximately 1,500 today. So last week, I also talked about how temples and shrines became the center of sake production starting in the 12th century. Like the monks in Burgundy, the abbots of Tamang'in created diaries. Entries in these diaries date from 1478 to 1618 and record many details of brewing in the temple. This was when brewers started using lactic acid fermentation, making shuba or seed mash, used to grow yeast, relying on lactic acid to inhibit microbial contamination, and then adding koji, water, and steamed rice in mashing stages to the shubo. Prior to this, brewers had used polished rice only for koji production, and unused polished rice to make sake. During this period, however, they started producing morohaku sake, or sake made using polished rice, both for the koji rice and the steamed rice added to the mash. These diaries also recorded the use of hiire, or pasteurization, with the morohaku sake. Along with these advances in brewing technology, innovations in woodworking technology enabled construction of large 1,500 liter vats, facilitating mass production of sake. This led to the full-fledged production of sake by specialists not affiliated with temples or shrines in the 16th century, known as the Muromachi period. In the 16th century, the technique of distillation was introduced into the Kyushu district from Ryuku. The brewing of shochu, called imosake, started and was sold at the central market in Kyoto. Let's touch upon shochu for just a minute and hit up the Book of Knowledge. Shochu is a Japanese distilled beverage less than 45% alcohol by volume. It is typically distilled from rice, barley, sweet potatoes, buckwheat, or brown sugar, though it is sometimes produced from other ingredients such as chestnut, sesame seeds, potatoes, or even carrots. Typically, shochu contains 25% alcohol by volume, which is weaker than baiju, whiskey, or vodka, but stronger than huangiju, sake, or wine. It is not uncommon for multiple distilled shochu which is more likely to be used in mixed drinks to contain up to 35% alcohol by volume. Its taste is usually far less fruity than sake and depends strongly on the nature of the starch used in the distilling process. Its flavor is often described as nutty or earthy. Not familiar with baiju or huangiju? Neither am I. Baiju is a clear liquor made from various grains. Baiju is compared to whiskey in terms of variation, complexity in flavor, and sensation. Its flavor can vary from simple, light, and subtle to savory, saucy, rich tasting, depending on the type. Huangiju, meaning yellow wine, is somewhat like sake in that it also goes through multiple parallel fermentation and uses rice along with other grains. Then there's soju from Korea. It sounds similar to shochu. Soju is a clear, colorless, distilled alcoholic beverage of Korean origin. 
It is usually consumed neat and its alcohol content varies from about 16.8% to 53% alcohol by volume. Most brands of soju are made in South Korea. While soju is traditionally made from rice, wheat, or barley, modern producers often replace rice with other starches such as potato and sweet potato. Okay, got that? Shochu is closer to something like vodka, being that it's clear, but not really. It's like calling sake a rice wine or saying it's like beer because of how it's made and that you can make beer using rice. All right, there are links below to the Wikipedia entries for all of these uh, for your reading pleasure. Hit me up if you have any of these, especially if you have the Huangiju, because I would love to try that stuff. Back to more history. For this part, the comprehensive guide to sake is going to be my main source with a few edits here and there to move things along. In the 17th century, during the Edo period, the Mohorohaku produced near Osaka in Itami, now Itami City in Hyogo Prefecture, and Ikeda, now Ikeda City in Osaka Prefecture, found its way into the three major cities of Kyoto, Osaka, and Edo, now Tokyo. It became especially popular in Edo, where it was called Kudarazaki. Production of Kudarazaki reached 38,000 kiloliters at the beginning of the 18th century. Large amounts of sake were packed in casks and transported by sailboat. 18th century sake production involved using about the same amount of polished rice, 1.3 to 2.3 tons per batch as now, and the mashing process was practically the same three-stage mashing process currently used. However, the ratio of added water to polished rice was only around half. This suggests that the people of that era preferred heavy, sweet sake with a high viscosity. All right, it's about to rain like a MF out here. So you may hear some rain hitting and some thunder and all that. So just letting you know. The records of the period also indicate that wood ash was added to the moromi or the main mash to reduce the acidity before filtering and also refer to the addition of spirits made by distilling sake kasu, which corresponds to the current practice of adding alcohol. The amount of spirits added was equivalent to around 10% of the weight of rice, resulting in sake with a high alcohol content that was resistant to spoiling. Remember, it was also during World War II that the practice of adding brewer's spirit became more common in order to stretch sake supplies. The start of the 19th century saw the center of sake production shift from Itama, Ikeda, and nearby areas to Naragogo. Naragogo refers to the five areas covered by the modern-day Nish Nishinomiya and Kobe cities in the Hyogo Prefecture. The techniques used for making sake from here featured the use of so-called Miyamizu, or water obtained from the uh, Nishinomiya uh, Hyogo Prefecture, which was discovered around 1850. It also included water wheel milling and the concentration of sake brewing in the colder part of the year. As mentioned last week, this Miyamizu contains large amounts of phosphates and potassium, which promote the proliferation of koji fungi and yeast, and strengthen moromi, or the main mash, fermentation. The shift from Foot treadles to water wheels for rice milling not only increased productivity, but boosted quality by increasing the level of milling, that is, lowering the seimaibuai. At the same time, the concentration of sake production in the winter, when there is less risk of bacterial contamination, facilitated stable production of high-quality sake. Mashing recipes came to resemble those used in modern sake brewing, and sake from Naragogo flourished as the center of Japanese sake brewing a status it retains to this day. In 1909, the National Institute, now the National Research Institute of Brewing, was established and made the important contribution to the development of sake brewing in subsequent years. Notably, the invention in 1909 of Yamaha-i-moto, an improved version of the Kimoto style, and Soku-jo-moto, which, which utilizes lactic acid. These contributed to the stabilization and streamlining of sake production, with the result that Soku Jomoto is now the most widely used method of producing shubo. I'll get to these methods in a bit. Quality appraisal programs were initiated with the aim of raising the level of brewing technology in 1911. The first national competition, now Zenkoku Shinshu Kanpio Kai, or the National New Sake Awards, was held, an institution that continues to this day. Prior to World War II, the government created its first classification system. 
1991, the current system of classification was created. More recent trends affecting sake include the notion of local production for local consumption, as regional areas take another look at the skills and assets they have to offer, leading to the development of new varieties of sake rice and unique types of sake yeast used in fermentation. Let's review the types of sake real quick. I'll pull up the pyramid I used last week that I got from Guildsum as a reference. So we have two main styles of sake with brewer spirit and sake without. Sake without will have the prefix of junmai. At the bottom is ordinary sake known as futsushu. It will typically have brewer spirit, but is not required. Then the first level of premium sake is hanjozo and just junmai. Next is the same, but either at a lower seimai buai of 60% or has some kind of special characteristic not found in the brewer's normal sake. The word tokubetsu will precede either hanjozo or junmai. Then comes ginjo with a saimai buai of 60%, and then daiginjo with daiginjo re representing the highest quality and lowest mill ratio of 50%. This number can get down to around 10% for most premium sake. Last week I talked about the fermentation process. Let's delve a little deeper into that. Remember that kojikin is a key component to MPF. Even though yeast is what creates the alcohol, it's the kojikin or koji mold that is the special sauce. This is what is used to create the starter mash known as shubo or moto. There are three ways this starter mash is created. Let's go to Wikipedia for this. Kimoto is the traditional orthodox method for preparing the starter mash which includes the laborious process of using poles to mix it into a paste, known as yama oroshi. This method was the standard for 300 years, but it is rare today. Yamahai is a simplified version of the Kimoto method introduced in the early 1900s. Yamahai skips the step of making yama oroshi or paste out of the starter mash. The full name for Yamahai is yama oroshi haishi, meaning discontinuation of yama oroshi. While the Yamahahi method was originally developed to speed production time compared to the Kimoto method, it is slower than the modern method and is now only used in specialty brews for the earthy flavors it produces. Sokujo, or quick fermentation, is the modern method of preparing the starter mash. Lactic acid produced naturally in the two slower traditional methods is added to the starter to inhibit unwanted bacteria. Sokujo sake tends to have a lighter flavor than kimoto or yamahai. Once fermentation happens, there are several ways the sake is handled to create the final product. Using the comprehensive guide to sake for this part, when the fermentation is complete, the moromi is filtered with cloth and the undissolved rice and yeast removed, leaving the new sake. This process may be done by placing the moromi in a cloth bag and using a machine to apply pressure from above or by using a horizontal machine similar to a beer mash filter press. The cake left over from the process is called sakikasu, or filtered sake cake. In addition to undissolved rice and yeast, it contains about 8% alcohol by weight. Sakikasu is highly nutritious and can be eaten as is or used as a raw ingredient for making shochu, or for pickling vegetables. It's kind of cool. Even the waste is used for something. This isn't unique to sake production. The leftovers in wine, beer, and spirits production can also be used for various things, so it's not all going to a landfill. So with the initial filtration, some turbidity remains. If the liquid is left to stand at low temperature, this precipitates out as sediment, and the clear part is transferred to another tank. This is very similar to cold filtered beer or cold stabilized wine. Most of that turbidity clumps together and gravity takes over and it falls to the bottom. It is then filtered to produce a clear liquid. However, sake that has been filtered to make it clear may lose its transparency during storage. This is due to changes in the proteins dissolved in the sake, causing them to become insoluble. The use of persimmon tannin or colloidal silica is approved for removing the proteins that causes cloudy appearance. In this case, not everything precipitates out from a cooler temperature. The addition of persimmon tannin is very similar to finding in wine where some kind of finding agent is introduced to the wine and it collects the oppositely charged proteins and they clump together and fall to the bottom. Use of active charcoal is also approved for decoloring, flavor adjustment, and control of the aging process. This is by removing substances that cause coloring and flavor changes. 
This technique is similar to the Lincoln County process used to charcoal filter whiskey in Tennessee. Jack Daniels is the most well known for touting this process. After sedimentation and filtering, most sake undergoes pasteurization, known as hiire, at a temperature of 60 to 65 degrees Celsius or 140 to 150 degrees Fahrenheit before storing. The purpose of pasteurization is to sterilize the liquid and at the same time to render any enzymes inactive. If the action of enzymes is allowed to continue, it increases the sweetness through the action of diastatic enzymes and alters the aroma through the action of oxidizing enzymes. Many sake products are pasteurized again during bottling. The heating of sake during the pasteurization process alters the aroma and leaves it with an unrefined taste. For this reason, it is allowed to age for six months to one year. Many sake products are brewed between autumn and winter following the harvesting of the rice, allowed to age during spring and summer, and then shipped the following autumn. The alcohol content of sake in tanks is 17 to 20 percent ABV, the same as at the mash filtration stage. As far as sake is concerned, this level is considered too high for consumption with meals, so brewers often add water to reduce the level to around 15% before bottling. They may also filter and pasteurize it again if necessary. That's the specifics of sake production. Now let's get into some more production terms associated with sake. Again, using Wikipedia as my main guidance here. Now you may see the term namazaki. This is a sake that has not been pasteurized. It requires refrigerated storage and has a shorter shelf life than pasteurized sake. Ginshu is undiluted sake. Most sake is diluted with water after brewing to lower the alcohol content from 17 to 20% down to 14 to 16%, but Genshu is not. Moroka means unfiltered. It refers to sake that has not been carbon filtered, but which has been pressed and separated from the lees, and thus is clear, not cloudy. Since we learned that carbon filtration can remove desirable flavors and odors as well as bad ones, thus Maroka sake has stronger flavors than filtered varieties. Nigori sake is cloudy sake. This sake is passed through a loose mesh to separate it from the mash. It is not filtered thereafter, and there is much rice sediment in the bottle. When it comes to serving sake, there are conflicting suggestions. One is that the sake bottle is shaken to mix the sediment and turn the sake white or cloudy. The other is that you should gently place the bottle in a refrigerator to chill for several hours before opening. The bottle must not be shaken. After opening the bottle, pour the sake slowly and carefully. So, two different schools of thoughts in serving nigori. Seishu, or clear or clean sake, as previously mentioned, is the Japanese legal term of sake and refers to sake in which the solids have been strained out, leaving clear liquid. Thus, nigori sake and duburoku, I'll get to this in a second, are not seishu and therefore are not actually sake under Japanese law. However, nigori sake can receive the seishu status by being strained clear and having the leaves put back in afterward. Koshu is aged sake. Most sake does not age well, but this specially made type can age for decades. The color of koshu ranges from yellow to amber. It has little ginjoka. This is the term for a more fruity aroma and flavor in ginjo and daiginjo sake due to the low sei mai bui. Instead, it has a caramel aroma with hints of honey, dried fruits, molasses, and soy sauce, similar to sherry Madeira, as well as an aroma suggestive of nuts and spices. It has a slightly bitter taste and a long finish. Bitterness is not normally considered a desirable trait in sake, but it is one of the characteristics of long aged sake. So if you remember last week, I talked about how regular sake can taste bitter to me. Um, it, there's like basically a lack of sweetness, not necessarily bitterness. Now, as I mentioned before, sake is usually allowed to age in storage for about six months to a year before shipment. With koshu, the aging process lasts at least three years, during which time the color and flavor change due to the Maillard reaction between the sugars and amino acids present in the sake. Taruzake is sake aged in wooden barrels or bottled in wooden casks. The wood used is cryptomeria, which is also known as Japanese cedar. Sake casks are often tapped ceremonially for the opening of buildings, businesses, parties, etc. because the wood imparts a strong flavor. Premium sake is rarely used for this type. Okay, that does it for the informational part of the show. If you want to know more 
or a more detailed account of everything I've just done, I encourage you to read Guild Psalms Expert Guide if you are a member. If you're not a member, but are in the industry, I, I then encourage you to join. It's the best 100 bucks a year you're gonna spend. You don't have to be in the industry to join. Um, you could just be a wine geek and just wanna learn more. All right, have another sake to try. In the interest of time, I won't go through any of the detailed history of the sake. I've linked to the website so you can read up on it. So let's just get to tasting. The sake for today's show is the Hagashiyama Brewery Konteki Pearls of Simplicity. It's about 20 bucks. It is a Jumai Daiginjo, so the top of the pyramid. The, it's from the Kyoto Prefecture. Seimai Buai, or the milling rate, is 50%. The rice type is Yamana Nishiki. Again, we have the good stuff. The Nihon Shudo, or sake meter value, is plus two. It's almost neutral. I'll be getting to that next week. The ABV is 15.5%. The acidity is 1.5. This equates to the middle of the range, which is one to two, with a lower number being lighter. More on this next week. The Toji, or master brewer, is Takakura-san. The rice farm, this is cool, Masayasu Tanaka. The water source, Fushimi Mizu, another one of Japan's best water sources for sake. All right, so let's try this while it's raining outside. I've heard a couple of those little thunderclaps. The last one did the same thing. All right. You may be wondering why I'm doing this in a wine glass. The, the upshot is wine glasses or white wine glasses are actually a good way to drink socket. We're gonna get into that next week. This is deep dive stuff. I didn't mention this last week or in this week, but what you're seeing is a precursor to what Psalm School Advanced is going to be. Though I'll probably have more graphics and other pictures and stuff that I'm doing really here, but this is a precursor to what that's going to be. All right, as I mentioned last week, we're not really going to look at the color because it all should be water white, unless we're talking aged sake, which we're not talking about that. Okay, so I have a moderate intensity of aromas. Um, there's a similarity between this one and the last one that I did last week's. But I would say it's a little more delicate. The rice candy aroma and the hibiscus and the floral isn't as prominent on the nose for me. There is, there's a, it feels like there's a little more richness to it, almost like a caramel, like a caramel green apple. I'm not sure how that's in this. There should be no Maillard reaction. There should be no caramelization, but it's really subtle. Let's taste it. The alcohol feels a little bit higher. It, it, it is. I know it is because it's 15.5 and that's what the text sheet said. Um, and it wasn't because I knew that I felt that I was like, oh, it's a little more potent. I was like, well, of course it is because it's 15.5% alcohol. I know I'm not saying I'm, I'm some, I'm some awesome person that can detect a half a percent of alcohol, but I tend to be pretty correct in my alcohol calls on wine or as far, what far as what the range is, not like the precision of this is a specific, um, alcohol percentage. The alcohol and other things are making it a richer product. The fact that it's um, a higher mill rate is also giving you that that richer flavor to me, um, but it's still lighter in the sense that it's still that floral and fruity. Uh, it's more caramel apple than say anything else. Uh, the rice candy part of it is not as prominent as the last one. It's more subtle. This is this is a more subtle sake. It doesn't really hit you in the face as much. With that said, it feels a little more complex. It's kind of a weird thing. It's like a, a lighter but more complex, uh, easier drinking, but at the same time, it's like this, I don't know, this weird combination of things. I feel like this really needs food. Whereas last week's sake is something I can just totally sit back and just relax and drink. This one, I really feel that I need something with a little bit of richness to it. I can see doing, of course, you do seafood with this, but I can see doing like a barbecue, um, a barbecue chicken, uh, pork. Uh, I feel like it just stands up a little more. There's a little more body to this. This is like a, 
a richer Chardonnay, whereas last week's was more like a like a Pinot Grigio or Vermentino type of thing. Uh, this has more broadness to it. You could definitely go down the savory part with this by having stuff that's, you know, with a decent amount of soy sauce to it. Uh, so if you're talking like in seafood or just any type of Asian fare, uh, dumplings would go great with this, especially if you dip it in, in the dipping sauce. Um, yeah, fried foods. If you want to get really crazy, you do something like a Wiener schnitzel with this um, and like some like roasted potatoes. I think it would go great with that. I mean, it, it feels like there's, it has more body to stand up to richer foods. I wouldn't necessarily put this with steak or anything like that, but something has a little bit more oomph to it. It's good. I like it. All right. Well, you know what? That's going to do it for today's show. If you like what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button, subscribe, and then tell your friends. And until next time, we'll have some more sake next week.